Karen Schollmeyer uh, got her PhD from Arizona State University back in 2009. She's currently teaching at Mesa Community College. And tonight, the talk will be Animal Bones and the Archaeology of Human Environmental Interactions. Karen? Thank you. I'm excited to be here tonight. This is a different sort of venue than I usually speak in. Um, as Bill mentioned, I spend a lot of time talking to undergraduates right now who have to be there and have to take notes on everything that I say. So it's kind of different for me to talk to an audience that's here pretty much by choice and to get to talk about sort of highlights um, of research that I've done as opposed to things that follow a particular curriculum. So I'm excited to be here for that reason. I'm also excited to talk about human environment interactions. I think this is an area that archaeology has a lot to say about and where archaeology can really contribute to issues that are very current. Uh, archaeology has this long-term record of looking at decisions that human ma humans make about how to use their environment, how to use their resources, and then we can see what the consequences of those, those decisions were, what happened as a result of those things that humans decided to do. And we can watch over time the consequences of how, that, how those decisions play out. And then we can see conditions change and how humans decide to change what they're doing to adapt to those changed conditions and what that then does to the environment. So it's almost like a long series of experiments where we can see humans using their resources and their environment in different ways and how that affects what humans can continue to do in the future. And this is obviously something that's very useful when we think about modern challenges and how we're going to use resources and how we're going to plan to have resources available in the future. So this is a conversation that I think archaeology should really be a part of. But obviously, if archaeologists study these things and we only publish the results of our studies in journals that are so long and filled with jargon that only other archaeologists read them, it's hard for us to be a part of that conversation. So it's good to be able to come to events like this and talk to other people and try and get the message out about what we think is really important about the research that we're doing and about the things that we've been finding. I study animal bones. I'm a zooarchaeologist. That's one of my specialties is studying animal bones. And I'm interested in human environment interactions. So most of what I'm going to talk about tonight is what we can learn about those interactions from studying animal bones. A couple of years ago, I started working on a research project with John Driver, who's an archaeologist at Simon Fraser University. And we are both really interested in what animal bones can tell us about these long-term changes in how humans use the environment. And in particular, what can animal bones tell us about hunting and whether hunting is sustainable over time? So we're interested in these questions. Are there types of hunting that people can do for a long, long time without seeming to have negative impacts on the animals that they're using? Are there types of hunting that seem to quickly use up the animals that people are hunting? Are there really broad scale patterns that we can see when we look at hunting and when we take advantage of that long time scale that archaeology has? Do we see patterns kind of pop out of, oh, these kinds of hunting seem to be things humans can do for a very long time? Are there other types of hunting or other kinds of animals people might use that are very sensitive or not so resilient to things that humans do? So we started looking at ratios of big animals to little animals. If you're thinking about this issue of hunting and you think, oh, what would I expect to happen? If you think about this for a minute, you probably think, oh, Little animals breed like rabbits, so chances of overhunting those are probably pretty slim. Big animals breed more slowly, chances of overhunting those might be greater. So that's where uh, John Driver and I started out with this research is, is that actually a reasonable assumption to make? Is that thing we kind of instinctively think is probably true, something that we can see when we look at the archaeological record of many times and many places? So we looked at the Southwest, we looked at other parts of the world to try and see are there long-term patterns that we see in hunting and in the difference between little animals and big animals. Do little animals seem like something people can hunt for a long time? And do big animals seem like they're more easily impacted? So in this talk today, I'm going to focus on the Southwest. If you look at the little handout that's on your tables, there's a map that shows some of the places that I'm talking about. Uh, I'm talking about big scale patterns, but I'll use as case studies three places you're probably familiar with Mesa Verde, the Zuni Cibola area, and the Mimbrace area, which is in southwest New Mexico. And if any of you were here for Pat Gilman's talk, she talked about the Mimbrace area quite a bit and about pottery there earlier uh, in this uh, set of talks. So when we looked for big patterns of the ratio between little and big animals, you can see on the other side of that sheet uh, a graph. It's not a particularly pretty graph, but it has a lot of information summarizing what we found. 
So we use what's called a small mammal index, which is little animals over little animals plus big animals. So it's basically a ratio of little to big animals over time. And so when you look at this graph, things on the bottom of the graph have a lot of big animals. Things on the top of the graph have a lot of little animals. So there's time periods running along the bottom of it, and there are sites that are little circles. So every site that we could find published information about the animal bones from is a little circle on that graph. And what you can see when you look at this is the oldest sites that we could find published information on, those are the ones that are labeled in the Paleo-Indian period. So we had six sites from that period that had well-published assemblages that we could use. Uh, that's down at the bottom of the chart. There's lots of big animals. That's not surprising. This is a time when people are moving around the landscape and they are probably, to some extent, specialized big game hunters. So there are a lot of big animals in these sites. Very quickly after that, the assemblages, the ratio of little to big animals in these assemblages jumps up. So you can see in subsequent time periods, they're up at the top of the graph. So once the Paleo-Indian period is over, people are using lots more, big anim lots more little animals, lots fewer big animals. So this tells us a couple of things. This tells us that as the landscape filled up with people, there was a shift in the ratio of big to little animals that people used. People weren't using as many big animals compared to little animals. This also tells us that this pattern lasted for a very long time. So if you look at the dates, BP is before present on that chart. If you look at those dates, this is covering many thousands of years. So there was an initial period when people were using mostly big animals, and then people switched over to mostly little animals, and that pattern lasted and lasted and lasted for a long time. This was somewhat known before. I mean, we were not the first archaeologists to discover this. And what people think, and I agree with, is that over time, the landscape was filling up with people. There were more and more people in the Southwest, so it got harder and harder to move. In earlier time periods, people would live in a place for a while, they would hunt the big animals that were right around there, they would use up the plants, and then they would move on to another place. So they were constantly moving around and they had constant access to these bigger animals. But as the landscape filled up with people, and later as people became farmers and weren't moving as much, people stayed in one place longer and longer in bigger and bigger groups, and they started using up some of the resources that were right around them that were really convenient. And it looks like they used up the big animals first, and they still had access to little animals. So we looked at this here in the southwest with a whole bunch of sites. You can see there's lots and lots of circles on that graph. We also looked at other parts of the world, and we saw the same pattern pretty much everywhere. So it looks like this is actually a robust pattern, what you would kind of first expect, that little animals don't get used up as easily as big animals do. So we think that this is kind of a hopeful message in some ways, because even though big animals seem to be pretty easy to use up on this graph, uh, little animals stay really common. So we're thinking, oh, this probably means that little animals are much more resilient to things like hunting. If you think about this for a minute, you can actually interpret this pattern that we saw in our data two different ways, right? You can say, oh, this means that people used up big animals, but there were still lots of little animals around. Or it could be that people used up all the animals, and there were barely any animals around, but of the little pitiful few that were left, more of them were little than big. So our next step was to try to figure out which of those things is actually what's going on. So we had to try and think of ways to get at that difference. One way to look at this is to see what happens when domesticated animals come into people's lives. So in the Southwest, as a lot of you probably know, uh, most places the main domesticated animal was the dog, but it doesn't look like those were a big part of people's diets in the Southwest. They weren't a, a big source of food. So domesticated dogs were around, and in most places that's pretty much it. And sometimes in places in the Southwest, later, people started to use domesticated turkeys. So we can say, oh, what happens when domesticated turkeys come in? If we look at other areas, for example, uh, the Iberian Peninsula, where Spain and Portugal are, that's an environment that's kind of similar to the Southwest in other ways. Uh, and there we can see a, a group of big domesticated animals coming in, sheep and goats and cows. So the data is particularly good in that area. What happens when domesticated animals come in and people start using domesticates? as their big source of meat uh, instead of wild things that they're hunting. Well, if people start getting more of their meat from domesticates, you expect hunting to become sort of secondary. And the, when people did put in the effort to go out and hunt, they would go after something that they really wanted. So if barely any wild animals were around, almost all of people's food came from domesticated animals, and the only time they're going out hunting, they're putting a really big effort into it, I would expect them to want to hunt something big.
those are animals that are prestigious and it's a big package of food. I would think they'd be going after big animals. But that's not what we see when we look at the bones. We see that after domesticated animals come into a place, there's still a lot of bones of little things and not very many bones of big things. So to me, that tells me that that hunting that's going on is actually casual and that when people feel like going out and hunting just to throw something extra into the pot, they're casually going out and they're getting little animals that are living close to their sites. Going hunting isn't a huge effort that you're going to devote. If you're going to devote that huge effort into finding an animal on a depleted landscape, you're going to go after something big. But that's not what we see. It doesn't look like people are putting a huge effort into hunting in a depleted landscape. It looks like people are casually going out and hunting, and what they're getting is rabbits. So to me, that says that even though a lot of time has passed, people have lived in place for a place for a long time, the animals that are still out there running around on the landscape are dominated by little things like rabbits. There are not a ton of, of deer left, but we're not looking at a place where all the animals are gone. So people still have access to animals, wild animals, but the wild animals that are easiest to get are bunnies. So it looks like little animals, uh, in the southwest that would be jackrabbits and cottontails, Little animals are something that's pretty resilient to human hunting. We can hunt those little animals for a very, very long time. On the graph that you saw, that's thousands and thousands of years uh, without driving them out of existence very easily. Big animals seem to be much more sensitive. So this is maybe good for the future of hunting little animals. It looks like it's relatively difficult to uh, run out of rabbits, for example. Another question you might ask is, well, that's, that's sort of a, a model based on data from a lot of different places. Uh, is it reasonable that we might see that kind of impact? So I look to see uh, whether it's easy to hunt out these big animals. How easy does it seem to be? Uh, to do this, I focused on one of the case study areas that's on your little handout on the map. Uh, I looked at the Membrace area, which is in southwest New Mexico. And that's an area where we know a couple of things that help us kind of get at this question of how easy is it to overhunt big animals. We have a good idea of how many big animals the modern landscape can support because there are a lot of wild, wildlife biologists who work there uh, and are interested in how many deer are out on the landscape because they're interested in how many hunting permits they can release and things like that. So there's a lot of good data on modern deer. It's also a place where we have a lot of good archaeological data. Uh, a lot of this is coming from work that was started by Peggy, Peggy Nelson and Michelle Hegman at Arizona State University, there's been a lot of survey over the years, so we know where most of the big archaeological sites are. They're not covered up by modern towns. There's not a lot of people living out there right now in the eastern part of this membrane area. So we can have a pretty good idea how many rooms there are from different time periods, and that lets us know roughly how many people were living in this place. So we have a good idea of how many people are living there. We have a good idea of how many deer can be supported on the landscape. So we can start to play with some numbers. Is it reasonable to think that that population on the landscape could easily overhunt the deer that that landscape might support? So I'm not going to drag you through the details of this, but I made a model of the deer population that's based on modern conservation biology studies to try to figure out how many deer, what percent of that population could people reasonably hunt without causing the population of deer to start to decline. And that's about 18% based on things like the density of the deer population in that place now, how much food there is for them, how often they tend to reproduce in that area, fertility rates, natural mortality rates, things like that. If you put all these numbers together, it looks like you can kill a maximum of about 18% of the deer population there before you start to make the deer population start to get smaller. So then I compared that to the human population that we think we have there. How many people were living there in different time periods? And if you look at the density of deer that landscape can probably support, if you kill about 18% of the population in this set of river valleys I was looking at, that's a little less than 100 deer every year in that area that I sort of drew a circle around and said I was going to focus on. Uh, people were living there in the classic membrane period and the post-classic. Right now I'm going to talk about the classic period, 1000 to 1130. That's when we have the best data on human populations. And in the first part of the classic period, um, the first probably 50 or 60 years, human populations were relatively lower. And I tried to figure out, well, what's the reasonable sort of demand that those populations might place on deer? Uh, and by reading a lot about how much meat people eat in different parts of the world today, how much different types of food contribute to the diet, uh, I, I came to the assumption that if people were getting about 7% of the fat that they need in their diet from deer, 
That would be about two quarter pounders a week. So if you imagine you're a prehistoric person living in this membrane area, and you're getting 7% of the fat in your diet from deer meat, all the rest of the fat that's in your diet is coming from other sources, other animals, plants, things like that, uh, you'd be eating two quarter pounders a week of deer. Obviously, that's just a guess to start with, but that's not an unreasonable amount of meat to eat. I think we probably all eat more than two quarter pounders of meat a week if we're not vegetarians in here. So I thought, well, if people are hunting that much, how much of a human population can that support? So if we look at the early part of the classic, the first 50 or 60 years, there's plenty of deer out there for people to have two quarter pounders a week made out of deer. So in the early part of this period, that's not a problem. But when we get to the middle and later part of the classic period, in order for everyone to keep eating two quarter pounders a week, like they might have been used to, they would have had to have hunted uh, about 150 deer. So they would have had to hunt quite a few more deer in that area than the deer population could support. So people are exceeding the maximum sustainable hunting rate for that deer population if they're going to keep eating two quarter pounders a week. So if people go on at this sort of higher population level, higher human population level, and eat two quarter pounders a week and hunt deer at that level for five years, they would very quickly exceed the maximum sustainable take of that deer population, and the deer population starts to crash in these models that I made. After five years, I modeled people eating two quarter pounders a week, and the population crashes. And I said, oh, well, after five years, they would probably notice, oh, there's a lot fewer deer out there. What if they have their consumption, so they're only eating one quarter pounder a week? Even after five years, having their consumption is not enough to fix it. They've already sunk the deer population so much that it can't recover. So in hunting that's too intense, even in a really short time, as short as five years in this particular environment, you can start to drive the deer population down. So again, this is a model. These are numbers that I, I didn't make them up out of a whole cloth, but they're numbers that I had to guess at because we don't know this perfectly for the archaeological record. But even if you quibble with these numbers a little bit, the pattern is the same, that it's easy in this environment, if you have a lot of people living in one place for a long time, it's easy to overhunt the deer and drive those populations down. So that makes that graph that's on the front of the handout, uh, that kind of reinforces that idea. Yes, it is pretty easy. If you have enough people living in one place long enough, it is quite easy to overhunt deer in this particular environment. It's not super productive for deer. So I did a couple things to try and check up on those guesses a little bit. So 18% for a hunting rate, that doesn't seem unreasonable if you look at game manager strategies now. People are still trying to do this now. They're trying to figure out, again, how many hunting permits can they issue uh, and have people, as many hunters out there getting deer as they, that population can support without reducing the population. And those numbers, sometimes they're as high as 20%, some places they're as low as 10. So 18% fits really pretty well in there. It seems pretty reasonable. If you look at biologists who work in places where human po humans come in and set up a new village, for example, in an area and start to hunt big animals. People who work in situations like that say that they can sometimes see the proportion of big to little animals change in as few as 10 to 20 years. So again, the idea that you could have a substantial impact on an animal population in five years, it's not unreasonable considering the things that people have seen today. So again, I think this is a pretty reliable thing. It is possible in the Southwest which isn't a super productive deer environment. It is possible to have an effect on these big animals very, very fast. So now you might be thinking, well, how much does that actually matter? There's bunnies out there. I've already hopefully convinced you that you can use lots of bunnies. You can eat lots and lots of them, even when you have a lot of people living in the place for a long time. Like, so what if the deer are gone? We'll just eat rabbits. So does this actually matter? I think that it does. It might not matter in terms of calories. Archaeologists often estimate that Prehistoric people were maybe getting 10% of their calories from meat. The vast majority of the calories that they're getting are coming from wild plants, and they're coming from plants that they grow. So given that a small amount of their calories come from meat, and of that meat, only a tiny amount is probably big animals if they're all hunted out, <coughs> why would the fact that deer are hunted out actually matter to them? I think it does for a couple of reasons, though. Uh, one is if you think about the economics of it. If you're going out and hunting, it's more efficient to get a big package of meat than a small one. So people would notice, oh, instead of going out and killing one antelope now, I have to go out and get a whole bunch of rabbits. That's something people would notice. They can still get the meat, but they're probably kind of bummed out that they have to do all this extra hunting and bring home rabbits. The other thing that's maybe more important is social. If you look at places all over the world where people hunt, there's a lot higher social status attached to killing something big than there is to killing something little. 
And I'm sure you know this to be true in our own society as well. When people show you pictures or post them on Facebook or something of hunting trips that they've been on, they're never showing you a bunny. <laughs> they're showing you a deer, preferably a deer with a big rack of antlers or something like that. They're not posting bunnies for the most part. So there's more social status attached to hunting big animals, which means when it's harder to hunt a big animal, hunters are going to notice. Oh, I can't impress everybody with how many deer I've gotten anymore because there's no deer out there. I have to bring home these rabbits and nobody looks twice at me. So people would notice it for that reason too. So that again is based on what we know about modern people. And that applies in many, many traditional societies all over the world and our own society as well. So you can kind of think about, well, are we sure that really applies in the past even though everybody now seems to feel that way? I think that it does. Uh, one way we can get at these ideas in the past, again, if we look at the Mimbrace area, uh, people made pots with naturalistic designs on them. So that handout that you have has one image from one of those pots <coughs> of some people, hunters, tracking a deer. So people living in that part of southwest New Mexico made these beautiful pots, which again, other people who've given lectures in this series have talked about, Pat Gilman, for example. Uh, Stephanie Culo, another archaeologist, and I did a study a few years ago where we looked at pots from one of the big membrane citrus is called galaz. And we compared the numbers of uh, mammals on these pots, and we looked at how many of them were showing bunnies, jackrabbits and cottontails, how many of those were showing big game. That's hoof mammals like deer and pronghorn and bighorn and maybe elk, although elk are really, really rare in the southwest prehistorically. So what are the ratios of these things? If we looked at the pots at the galaz ruin, 34% of the mammal pots were showing big game. So all the pots that had mammals on them, 34% are showing big animals. Only 16% are showing bunnies. Then we compared them to the bones from the Galaz site and from other sites from the same time period. And the results are quite, quite different. 3% of the bones are big animals. 37% are bunnies. So they're not, showing what's, <coughs> they're not showing what they're eating on the pots. They're showing what's important to them. They're showing lots and lots of big animals and not so many bunnies. What they're actually eating is lots and lots of bunnies and not so many big animals. And the fact that they're choosing to paint the big animals on the pots indicates that the big animals are important to them. They're not just painting what's in their bowl. They're painting things that are important to them. So that's another indicator that big animals are important to people. So even if they're not contributing a ton of calories, this decline in big animals is probably still something that people are worried about. One last example of why I think this is true, uh, if you look at ethnographic studies of Pueblos in the historic past, there are accounts of ceremonies for which a deer is required. So in order to complete a ceremony successfully, you have to bring back a deer. <coughs> and if you can't get a deer, if you go out to get a deer for the ceremony and you can't find one, that's often seen as a sign that something's wrong. Maybe the people in your village have been behaving badly, they've made natural forces angry, something is wrong in the balance between your village and the natural world. And that's going to deeply affect people. If they can't have a successful ceremony, they can't carry out their religious obligations because they can't find deer, that's going to send them a signal that there's something wrong with the balance between the human world and the natural world. So for all these reasons, I think this does matter, this change in access to big animals. So now I've told you about a couple of things. I told you about this big, broad study where we see Little animals used for a long time, and big animals seem to get depleted pretty quickly. I told you about modeling that I did to try and see whether this is reasonable, and it seems like it is. Uh, then I wanted to focus in on trying to see these changes archaeologically. Can we look at archaeological data and actually see people hunting out these animals in a smaller area over time? Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit now about the Mesa Verde area, which is another area that's on your map. And this is a great place for archaeology. We have this long record. I'm going to be talking about the period from A.D. 750 to 1300 or so. But uh, I'm using data from Crow Canyon Archaeological Center. Um, and they have divided up this time period into very, very fine scale groups of assemblages, very fine scale uh, samples of bones that have come out of archaeological sites, bones and pottery and other things. So we actually have slices of this time period, this period sliced up into periods of about 40 <coughs> to 80 years. So we have these little slices of this long time. I wanted to know, can I look at those little slices and see these changes happening? And I can, actually. It's very exciting. When I look at these little slices of 40 to 80 year time periods, the first few time periods we have, there's quite a few big animals in the group of animal bones from an archaeological site in the assemblage. Uh, once we hit about the Pueblo II period, suddenly there's a lot less big animals and a lot more bunnies. 
So we can actually see within one of these 80, 40 to 80 year slices of time, the proportion of big to little animals has suddenly changed quite a bit. It drops by about half. This is a time when villages have gotten bigger. The population density in that area has gotten a lot higher, and people are not moving around as much. So this kind of reinforces this pattern I was talking about earlier. More people, less mobility, big animals get affected very quickly. From then on, in each 40 to 80 year slice of time that I look at, the big animal proportion drops by about half. Half again, and half again, and half again. So suddenly and very fast, we see this change. We see less access to big animals and more use of little animals. So again, it's reinforcing the fact that this happens pretty easily. Now we can actually see this happening archaeologically. As the big animals decline, we see turkeys suddenly become an important domesticated food animal in this area. So it seems like to some extent turkeys might be replacing uh, big animals like deer and antelope in people's diets, and then they're relying on rabbits to a large extent. So one of the neat things about this example, when you can see these really fine slices of time, is we're starting to get at something that's more like a human lifespan. So you can imagine people living in these sites who had heard stories from their grandparents about times when deer were pretty plentiful and when turkeys were not considered food. And they're growing up in a time when they're eating lots of turkeys their grandparents wouldn't have touched, and there's very few deer out there on the landscape. So this is another example where we can see impacts on deer coming very, very quickly. And small mammals, and eventually turkey as a domesticated animal, being something that people rely on for a very, very long time as a more stable kind of resource. To get back again to this first picture that you have on your handout, something that some of you may have noticed when you're looking at this graph uh, is that this last bar, the period that I've called early villages, the latest time period, those dots are all over the place. So the average site from that time period has lots and lots of little animals and very few big ones. They're all clumped up at the top. But there's a lot of exceptions, too. The sites are spread out all over. So obviously, sample size has something to do with this. I have lots more sites from that late time period, so of course I'm going to get a better sense of the variation than I, some of these early time periods where we have very few assemblages to work with. But this was very intriguing to me, that there's so much variation in this late time period. We've got lots of sites. The vast majority of sites have a few big animals and a lot of little ones. But there's also sites out there that seem to be quite different. There's late period sites that seem to retain access to big animals. So I got interested in this question of why is that? What lets some places keep using big animals? What lets some places retain access to big animals in a time when most people around them are relying very, very heavily on little ones? So I wanted to look at some different examples of places in the Southwest where we know, again, a lot about how many humans there were, where the humans were living, and how they're using the animals to try and get at, is there some reason behind this pattern? What gives a site long-term access to big animals? So to start out looking at that question, I went back to my, my sort of default case study, the Membrace again. This is the place I wrote my dissertation about, in case you're wondering. So I tend to, oh, Membrace this, Membrace that. So first I looked back at the Membrace area. And this is what you have a map of on the back of your handout. You have all these little pie charts spread out over a map. So I thought, oh, here's another use of this data that I'm very comfortable with by now. I'm going to put a bunch of pie charts on this map of membrane sites. And the charts are showing you, again, ratios of big to little animals. <coughs> so you can see the, the, the blue color on your pie charts, the darker slice of pie is deer. And the lighter slice of pie that's yellow, if you have a color chart, uh, that's the bunnies. So here's proportions of deer to bunnies plotted out on a map. So you can see them coming from individual sites. I drew little blue circles around all the sites that I have a sample from. And those are seven kilometers. They have a radius of seven kilometers. I read a lot about people who hunt traditionally. And a lot of the things that I read said that as an everyday sort of hunting area, a place where you casually go out and hunt, people are sticking within about seven kilometers of where they live. They take longer hunting trips that are planned in advance to more distant areas, of course. But as far as everyday sort of getting animals, the majority of them are coming from this about seven kilometer radius area. So that's what those little circles are on this map. In the Membrace area, there's a period of occupation before this. So 1000 to 1130 is a classic period. There's pit house period occupation earlier than this. Uh, in the Membrace area, pit house sites are usually right underneath classic sites. So people have been living basically on the same spots on this landscape for many, many, many hundreds of years. So what I'm getting when I look at the Membrace area is a picture of a landscape that's already been impacted by people. So this chart is showing you a landscape where people have been living for a very long time. The early impacts of deer have, on deer have already happened. And this is what's left. 
So interestingly, you can see again, there's pies that have lots and lots of bunnies and very few deer. And then there are pies that kind of jump out at you as having lots of deer relatively compared to bunnies. So why is that happening? In this landscape where all of those little circles are pretty much a deer depleted landscape in theory, why do some places still have more deer than others? If you look at this for a long time and kind of think about the characteristics of these places, places that tend to have more deer, places that tend to have a bigger slice of blue pie, tend to be two things. They tend to be on the edge of a group of settlements and or they tend to be high up, high elevation, sites toward the mountains. So if you look down at lower elevations, uh, which is the sort of lighter yellow colors on the map, even the sites on the edge of the group of settlements and the lower elevations have a pretty small piece of blue pie. But if you look up towards the high elevations, sites on the edge of the group of settlements up there tend to have bigger pieces of blue pie. So it looks like there's some relationship between location relative to your neighbors, high elevation, and access to deer on this landscape that's mostly depleted of deer. I looked at things like the population of each of these sites, the number of people living within seven kilometers of each of these sites, and that didn't seem to have any relationship with the ratio of big to small animals. So it, does, it seems to be something that's combining position in the settlement group and elevation. But oh, that's pretty interesting. I should probably check that in some other places. So uh, I looked at the Zuni area, which is the third sort of case study area on the other side of your handout. And I got a very, very similar pattern there too. Uh, in Zuni, the Zuni Cibola region, the settlement pattern over time is a little bit different. So using work from map peoples from, center, from uh, Archaeology Southwest, uh, Keith Kintig, who's at Arizona State, and Greg Schachner, who's at UCLA, they've figured out that over time, uh, some settlements grew pretty much right where they were. Other settlements moved up in elevation, and people moved and founded these big villages in new areas where people hadn't really been sedentary farmers before. So now we have a mix of places that have already been hunted out for deer, these sort of rings that are already emptied of deer, and places where they put the ring on a brand new spot on the landscape. They have sort of a fresh start. So when I do a very similar analysis to this, but in the Zuni region, the places that weren't inhabited before, the places where people have a fresh start, I can see that they have lots and lots of deer relative, uh, and deer and pronghorn antelope relative to bunnies, relative to jackrabbits and cottontails. And then over time, that access to the big animals shrinks. In places that have been inhabited for a long time and continue to be inhabited in these big sites, uh, again, we get this really variable pattern. Some places don't have a lot of big animals, most places don't have a lot of big animals. They have a lot of bunnies, but a few places have a lot more big animals. And when I look and try and see what are the sites that stand out as having unexpectedly high numbers of big animals, again, it's the sites that are on the edge of a group of settlements and or at high elevations. So it seems like you pretty much have to have both of those things. Sometimes high, high elevation is enough to do it for you, but usually you have to have both. So this is a very interesting pattern. And this brings me back around to the issue of contemporary uses of this information. I turned to conservation biology literature to try and explain why am I getting this pattern. And biologists write about something called source sink dynamics in animal populations. Uh, what that means is there are source areas where animals breed fast enough that they can actually overproduce, fill up that landscape, and then animals move out of the sources and start living in other places. So sources, animals breed a lot, too many, and they move out. Sinks are places where animals can't breed fast enough to replace themselves. And if a sink is left alo alone, eventually all of those animals will disappear from that sink. So one way in which this often gets used in conservation biology is the idea that the places around where humans live and hunt, places around human villages are sinks. Mm -hmm. People are hunting certain kinds of animals there, populations of those animals decrease, they can't sustain themselves. But if you're lucky, you might live near a source, a place where there's lots of animals and they're breeding a lot, and if you live in the right spot, animals will migrate down out of that source when it gets full, and they'll move into the sink. And they'll think, oh, what a wonderful landscape. There's all these gardens to eat. Um, <laughs> there's all this corn and squash and all these things that people have planted. And for some reason, there's no other deer here. What a wonderful place to live. <laughs> and then the person who owns that field will go out and shoot them and eat them. So this is an idea that comes from conservation biology. And I think that this is probably explaining some of this pattern that I'm seeing in the Southwest. I think that those high elevation areas that don't have sites in them, which you can see on your map, the sites on the map, by the way, are 
pretty much all of the big sites. So those places that don't have dots in them, they don't have people living in them full time. People are just using them occasionally. They're not living up there. So those big empty-ish places of full-time habitation at least, places where people aren't living permanently, if they're up there in the high elevations where people can't farm, for example, it's too cold to grow corn, the growing season's not long enough, there's reasons people aren't living in those places. But if those places where people aren't living in are also at high elevations, I think those are probably source areas for deer and pronghorn. And the deer and pronghorn are breeding up there. And since people don't go up there as often, although I'm sure they went sometimes on long hunting trips, uh, those populations aren't getting hunted down, and so they're happily breeding up there. Places that are near those areas and on the edge of a group of sites get the trickle down from those sources. Deer and pronghorn are breeding up there, and they're trickling down. The people who live on the sites with convenient access to them are getting the animals that move into their sinks. They're sort of hunted out donuts around their village. If you live in the middle of a really dense cluster of villages, or if you live at a lower elevation that's not a productive source area for deer and pronghorn, you're not going to benefit from those sources. So I think that source sink dynamics <coughs> is probably a good explanation for this funny pattern that we see in which a lot of places hunt out big animals really early, but some <coughs> places seem to maintain access over a very, very long time. I think that this, this is something that I'm still working on. It's kind of a new discovery, and I've got several different directions I'm going to go in to try and check that and see if I can test this in other ways and see if that really does seem to be a good explanation for what's going on. But I'm really excited about going in this direction because I think this is a place where archaeology can, can contribute to things that are still of interest to people now. So there's a lot of parts of the world now where hunting wild animals is still really important. Uh, the tropics, especially bushmeat hunting, hunting wild animals, can be a really important source of food for people. In some places, people either don't have a tradition of raising domesticated animals or domesticated animals are hard to raise there for some reason because of diseases or because of raising the food to feed your domesticated animals or something like that. There are various places where hunting wild game is still really important. Sometimes it's important socially for people, but often it's very important as a food source for people. That's their main source of meat. Uh, and it's a lot harder to get things like protein and fat, although not impossible, it's a lot harder to get them from plants. So that meat is really important to people. And as populations of humans in those areas grow, they're putting pressure on those sources of meat that those sources of meat haven't had before. So they're putting pressure on wild animals that's exceeding what's traditionally been there in the past. Uh, and as people expand and move into new places, people are starting to worry about maintaining long-term access to that meat. Two generations from now, are people living there still going to be able to get those wild animals that they need? Also, two generations from now, are those wild animals still going to live there? Are they going to be locally extirpated or even go extinct? So this is a big, important issue. People obviously are working on this in those places now, trying things like quotas to try and manage hunting and see if they can find that balance between human demands and preserving that resource for the future. But one of the things that people are talking about is this source sink idea. And maybe establishing reserves uh, can allow animals to breed, move down and feed the people so that people can continue hunting and the animals will also be protected and have a place where they can continue to produce more animals in order to feed people. Uh, studies on this now are on the order of like 10 to 20 years long. It's very hard to do a study uh, that's more than 20 years long. It's hard to live in a place for that long and keep gathering this data. It's a lot of work for the scientists. So if archaeology can identify places where this source sink dynamic seems to be working over the long term, I think that can really help contribute to this kind of argument. We have a record of hundreds of years where maybe source sink dynamics is working in some places. We also have a record of thousands of years where it looks like small animals can be hunted without driving down those populations. Obviously, the Southwest is a really different environment from a tropical rainforest. I'm not going to go trotting down to Peru and say, look, I've solved your problems, because I have very different data. But I think that by saying, oh, look, there are cases when, when circumstances are right, small animals can be sustainably hunted for a very long time. There are cases where, when circumstances are right, source sink dynamics can allow people to access big animals while hunting as much as they want in the daily sort of hunting area around their villages. There are cases where this does seem to be possible. Uh, and giving that information to people who work in areas like the tropics, maybe they can use that to figure out what the best way to manage their own resources is. So people living in these places where hunting wild animals is important, I'm hoping will be interested in this kind of information and conservation biologists uh, who work in those areas. So I hope this is a way that archaeology can kind of contribute to bigger issues that are affecting us now by using this long-term record that we have.
So hopefully I've convinced you of that too. Um, and we can talk about it now if you have any questions or things that this made you think about. I'll let uh, Bill kind of open it back up. I think that uh, Karen has shown us some of her passion about her subject and uh, now you have a chance to ask her some questions. And I'll, I'll bring the microphone around to you again if you have those pieces of paper. If you don't feel comfortable uh, talking into the microphone, I'll be happy to present the questions and uh, let Karen answer. So, Ellen, you can start. I've got, I've got two questions. One of them is, how does this reflect in rock art? If it's showing up in members' pottery that the animals there are ideal animals, ones they're hunting, or power animals, does this have any um, comparison with rock art? I think it might with cave art. I'm looking at Europe. Those are big animals. They're not necessarily things you eat. But I don't know for much, if anything much has been done in this country with rock art. And the other question is about fish. Has anybody done anything with that? The fish designs do show up in members' pots. Mm -hmm. How does that work as an energy source? Because like, you don't have to be near an ocean. Yeah. Uh, I'll try to answer both parts. Hopefully I'll remember them both. <laughs> the, uh, the rock art question, people in every medium where they're showing images or something, they're showing what's important. And what's important is not always what you actually have. So they're not necessarily showing things that are common and all around them. They're showing things that are important to them. So I think that's a very good comparison, the cave art in Europe and what's on membrace bowls. Um, when we look at rock art in the southwest, there are a lot of big animals in rock art, too. If you go hiking around here, for example, you'll see bighorn sheep all over the place. If you look at the bone from a Hocom site, most of the time you're not going to find much bighorn sheep at all. You're going to find a million rabbits that are smashed to smithereens. So again, they're showing animals that are important to them. Uh, I think many, many cultures all over the world, we can see that. People are showing things that are important to them. So um, yes, I think that rock art is another sort of aspect of this. People are showing what's important to them, and those things are often big animals. And they are often fish, too. So fish is a really interesting thing in the Southwest for zooarchaeologists. Uh, a lot of places, people don't seem to have been eating fish, as far as we can tell. We look for their bones in the bone assemblage, there's very, very few in a lot of places, not everywhere, which I'll tell you about in a sec. But uh, for example, in the membrace area, there's almost no fish. For a while, we thought we just weren't catching the bones. Maybe our screens were too big and we weren't finding the bones because fish bones are often really little. But now, a lot of us take samples, which we put through a much, much smaller screen, uh, like flotation samples, for example. We pass through a very, very, very small sieve with water. And we look very carefully through those samples to find little tiny things. And we're still finding almost no fish bone. So it seems like, in the mid-race area at least, fish bones are not ending up in the site. That could mean that people eat fish, but they only eat them somewhere far away, and the bones never end up in the site. And we'll never be able to know that. <coughs> or it could mean that they're not eating fish, and for some reason that's not allowed. Membrace doesn't use domestic turkeys either. There's almost no turkey bones. There's wild turkeys running around up there now, but there's almost no turkey bones. So there's fish in the pottery, and there's turkeys in the pottery, but their bones are not in the sites. So I think just like we do now, there's things people think of as food and things people think of as not food. I think most people in this room think of grasshoppers as not food. But obviously, if you go to other parts of the world, people think of grasshoppers as food. So maybe fish and turkeys or something like that. Um, in the whole calm area, people use fish a lot more. That seems to be a difference that they have with other parts of the Southwest. Most of the Southwest, there's not much fish. In the whole calm area, there's a lot more. I didn't talk about whole calm fauna very much. It's kind of a different kettle of fish, so to speak. Um, this is an even harder area for large mammals because it's an even less rich environment for them to live and breed in, except along the rivers, which is really nice and is where tons and tons of people live. So um, Ho'okam sites have even fewer big animals for the most part, except a few special ones that seem to have been a center for trading things back and forth, maybe getting big animals from somewhere else. So there is more fish bone in Ho'okam sites too, and that seems to be a, have been a more important source of food here. Does the increase in human populations affect the apex predators, i.e. the wolf? that may allow the population of large animals to increase or decrease. Did, is that accounted for in what you're looking at? Because, you know, since the white man came, the wolf became decimated. But obviously, when 
human form comes in in any form that it's going to affect the apex predators because they're going to want to keep them away from their prized uh, antelope or deer. Right. Um, I did another set of analyses that I didn't really talk about where I looked at the resilience of lots of different animals to things that humans do. So not just hunting, but planting gardens and various kinds of anthropogenic landscape change that we tend to do when we move in places. <coughs> and I ranked all the different animals that we find in the Southwest in terms of how well they put up with the stuff that humans do, basically. So things like <coughs> rodents and bunnies, for the most part, do really well under those kinds of circumstances. But the things that do really poorly in the Southwest are big hoofed mammals, deer, pronghorn, and uh, bighorn, and those big predators, wolves and mountain lions and bears and things like that. So those would definitely have been something that was affected quite easily by humans. Um, and as humans were hunting lots and lots of deer, they're probably also one way or another driving out the big predators that live near them. So those big predators were probably stuck up in the source habitats for, for those animals. But they're, again, not right around where people live. So in some ways, maybe you think, oh, that might free up more big animals for people to hunt because those big predators aren't there. But there's so many people in these places during the time periods that I'm talking about that I think the effect of like one mountain lion probably doesn't even matter. They're just swamped by all the people who are eating things. Does that answer your question? I was just wondering um, to what extent it might be possible that some of the pattern that you're observing could be a result of deliberate choices and not entirely resource depletion with respect to the large game. I mean, it seems as people are spending more of their time devoted towards plant production, you know, agriculture and horticulture, that it may be that hunting of large game, which is a fairly intensive kind of activity would be you know, diminished perhaps to special occasions. Um, and that a smaller game, which as you pointed out, the large game are attracted to people's gardens, but of course so are the smaller game, that they're becoming much more, uh, they may be you know, coming to you. And um, with respect to the question of you can get a lot more protein out of one deer than a bunch of bunnies, but while that's with respect to um, hunting effort, while that's certainly true of rabbits, of cottontails, I think that jackrabbits <coughs> can be communally hunted. You can you know, mass harvest them, and it might, in fact, be, if you're tied to your garden plot, it might be a lot easier to actually get yourself a bunch of jackrabbits than to go out hunting for a deer. Right. So I was just wondering if that could account for some of the pattern that you're seeing. Yeah, there's a couple of really interesting things in that question that you asked. So the idea of garden hunting is one, that people are hunting while they're out working in the gardens, basically, and they're hunting things that are drawn to gardens. Uh, in the Southwest, gardens probably would have been drawing in a lot of things. So they're drawing in the bunnies, and they're also drawing in deer, maybe not pronghorn, but maybe. Um, but those, if one of those got into your garden, it would really do a number on your corn crop. So you'd be very highly motivated to hunt anything that's trying to get into your garden. Um, a fellow student, at, a student who goes to ASU who I work with on some projects there uh, is doing some experimental maize agriculture uh, in the Gila River Indian community right now. And his first experimental plots were all eaten up by gophers. <laughs> so they're horrible. I mean, I, I imagine people in the past kind of waging war on these pests. So you're right. A lot of the hunting they probably did was probably related to the agriculture that they were doing. When I'm looking at these places within about seven kilometers of the sites, I think a lot of that same area was where people's farm plots were. But prehistorically, people would spread out their corn plots so that they could take advantage of the spotty kind of rainfall that we have in the southwest. So people are probably running around that area to their different garden plots, and they're hunting animals that they encounter in that space. So I think the fact that I'm thinking about this localized depletion as being within those seven kilometer circles for the most part, and those are also the places where people are garden hunting, I think I'm kind of getting that pattern. So the long distance hunts are a little harder to see because often if you're going out on some three day trip to hunt deer, you're not gonna bring back a bunch of heavy bones. You're gonna dry the meat and turn it into jerky or something like that, and I will never see the bones because they will not get brought back to the archeological site. So that's sort of hard to get at. <laughs> 
But you also asked about people's decisions about what to hunt uh, and about sort of social things that are playing into these ratios. Uh, and that's also a really interesting thing. Sometimes if we look at the parts of a site that these different bones are coming from, we see interesting patterns there. So for example, in the Mesa Verde area, some sites uh, there have these big tower complexes in them, like Sand Canyon, for example, is one. And it looks like there's actually more bones of big animals in some of these tower complexes than there are in the rest of the site. So maybe there's some kind of special thing going on there, uh, a ritual or high status people or something like that is making more big animal bones end up in certain places. There are certain pit houses and kivas also that end up with more big animal bones in them. So it's possible that some of the sites that I looked at that have a bigger piece of blue pie, a bigger sort of deer share, maybe some of what's contributing to that is because the site had some special thing going on. So uh, I tried to look at places where there were a lot of big animals and see if they all seemed to be coming out of like a really large community room or something like that. And I didn't see big numbers, uh, but that's definitely something to be aware of in doing these kinds of studies is to keep checking that and see like, are these coming from a special context that shows that people are deciding to go to a big effort and collect a lot of large animals and bring them here? And is that gonna throw off things that you might at first try to attribute to the natural environment? Is that really the social environment? So that's a good question. I hope I answered it. <laughs> what about mass harvesting jackrabbits? Oh, um, that is another thing that contributes to that sort of social environment and fauna. Uh, a lot of times, if we read ethnographic accounts, mass harvests were done before you had a whole bunch of people come and visit you. So if you're having a ceremony or a feast or something, and you need to feed a whole bunch of people, everyone would get together and drive jackrabbits. You can't do that with cottontails very well because they freeze and sort of try and hope that you don't see them, and jackrabbits will run away. If you search the internet, you can find these nightmare images of jackrabbit drives in the 30s where there's just like hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of them ending up in big nets. Uh, so that can work pretty well. And we think that people were doing this prehistorically too. There are membrane bowls actually that have pictures of people holding up nets and driving jackrabbits into them. So it's possible that some of these things are a social sort of difference. I don't know how, would I, how I would identify a site that had jackrabbit drives versus a site that didn't. I looked at ratios of jackrabbits to cottontails in all these places because I was interested in the vegetation around them. Um, and it seems like the ratio of jackrabbits to cottontails isn't really skewed towards jackrabbits in any of these places. So uh, it seems like they're probably doing drives sometimes, but it's not dominating the faunal assemblage. That's really interesting. I can later on give you a citation to some um, the, some work that we did where we're almost positive that we had this is in Eastern Oregon, and it was a 9,000-year-old oh, cool. site. Wow. So that shows that it seems to have been a pattern that was used in some areas. There's one in Arizona, Arizona, yeah. There's one in Arizona that's a memory site that's a jackrabbit drive, too. So they're out there, but they're not these ones that I used. To follow up on her, her question, the hunter has the variable of his skill level and his motivation, mm -hmm. but also the animals adapt and how do you how do you account for that variable like I, I I think that I could hunt doves with a baseball bat but I could never hunt a hawk yeah um, you get what I'm saying yes this is also something that varies from place to place too so the fact that deer are something that's easier to hunt out here the deer probably are getting wilier over time uh, and the deer that last the longest in these places where people are hunting heavily are sort of smart deer that have adapted. Um, there's places with a different environment where this doesn't work. So for example, in the tropics, there are lots and lots of animals of all different sizes. In the southwest, we have this set of big things and this set of little things, and deer, are, deer pronghorn, and bighorn are basically in the set of big things. Uh, in the tropics, deer actually do really well under human pressure. There are other things that get hunted out very easily, like tapers. Uh, and large body primates and things like that. Those seem to disappear quite quickly, but there's this dense vegetation that deer can hide in, and they'll often shift to a more nocturnal activity pattern so they can raid people's cornfields at night and then hide in this really dense vegetation, and they're living in a more productive environment, and they actually don't get hunted out very easily. This happens apparently in the southeast as well. There's places where there's just tons and tons of deer, and they reproduce really fast, and it's difficult to hunt them out quickly. So I think this is really a southwestern kind of thing. 
um, that deer are still the biggest, most attractive meat source out there, and it's not a super productive environment for them. So even though they get kind of wily and get better at avoiding the hunters, uh, it's not enough for them to, to keep being around in large numbers. Um, this is more a question regarding the Hohokam, but uh, in your uh, studies, have you ever found any uh, good evidence that mountain sheep, that the uh, desert sheep were ever in the Phoenix area in appreciable numbers? They're quite common in the ceramics and the rock art assemblage. <coughs> but were they ever actually living in this area? And were they just hunted out and that's why they're not seen anymore around here? Um, if you're asking about prehistorically, it does seem like they were hunted out very quickly uh, in the Phoenix Basin. So if you go to like the average site around here, there'll be very few big animals and mostly little tiny things crunched up. Uh, but there's certain sites that do have a lot of bighorn. So it seems like some places did have access to a sort of a, a good source of bighorn. And some of those places may have been hunting a lot of them and trading them to people down here who didn't have very many left, maybe getting pottery or something like that. So uh, again, that's very patchy. And again, I didn't talk about that case in this talk because it's very different from other parts of the Southwest in a lot of ways. But yes, it does seem like in the area right around where people, live, where, where people were living, there's not a lot of them. But there are some sites in the outlying areas that have good access. So it's a very, very patchy distribution. All right, thank you. And again, if people have uh, written uh, questions, I will come around and pick them up. Just sort of hold your hand up when I'm in the neighborhood. We got a question back here. Yeah. Uh, I found your thesis of uh, source sink and garden hunting you know, very intriguing. Uh, I was wondering two things. Um, you know, can you comment on the, then you know, extending that perhaps, can you comment on the idea of, of then gardens being, you know, set up as a source of bait basically for, for that garden hunting purpose? And then secondly, um, is there any relationship between what bigger, you know, game animals like deer would have as an interest in eating relative to what humans would have in an interest in planting uh, for their own consumption? Uh, and would there be an overlap between those that would further support your thesis? Um, deer like corn. <laughs> uh, we know that now. I mean, people will feed deer corn. They'll happily eat it. They'll raid corn fields and things like that. I actually looked at this a little bit in another study that I did um, I worked with Joan Coltrane, who's at the University of Utah, and does isotope analysis of bone, uh, bone collagen. And we looked at the ratios of carbon-12 to carbon-13 uh, in the bones of mostly deer and a few pronghorn to try and get at whether they were eating corn. Um, plants grow in different ways that incorporate different proportions of those isotopes from the atmosphere. Uh, and corn happens to grow in a different way, so it incorporates a different isotope proportion of 12 to 13 than, than other, most other southwestern plants do. And if you look at uh, the bones of creatures that ate that corn, you can then see that isotope signature in their bones. So I was trying to get at how far away deer might have been coming from and whether there's bones and sites from deer that were way up in the mountains away from all the cornfields or whether the bones that we find in sites were often coming from uh, the local area where there was a lot of corn. And I found that the deer in the Membrace area, which is where my sample came from, they were eating some corn, not tons of it, but some. So you can kind of kill two birds with one stone, I think. You can plant a plot of corn that you're going to eat, uh, and squash and beans and all the other plants that people might want to have, and that'll also attract deer. So whether people planted those in an outlying area on purpose, thinking, oh, we can have a nice garden here, and we might also attract animals that we can hunt, um, I'm not really sure how we'd know that because they can probably grow pretty much the same things. But people, people who work in Europe especially have, have brought that up before. Like I guess in Europe there's sometimes people will go out and plant a special area mostly to attract animals so they can hunt them. So people could have done that and they could have harvested all the plants and then eaten them when they were done and that would have worked well too. The uh, final nail in Chaco's coffin was anemia, severe anemia. And estimates are about 80. I believe 84, 86 percent of all the people in that region working on Chaco had severe anemia by 1130 when it collapsed. Have you looked at that at all, the, 
the decline of red meat and the rise of anemia, have, has that entered into your studies at all? I tried to look at that a little bit in the membrane area. Um, there's some data from mortuary analyses in the membrane area, and I, don't, I didn't see any change over time in rates of things like porotic hyperostosis that may be tied to iron deficiency anemia, but it wasn't the greatest sample ever, so I'm not really sure. Well, there's the also... The bone record at Chaco shows that they ate all the big animals, then they ate all the small animals, and they finally ended up eating all their mice. And that's because they had such a tremendous population there in the wintertime, building all those big buildings. They just flat ran out of food, and that caused the end of them. I'm actually hoping to start a project with an archaeological chemist. I'm actually working on a proposal right now to try and look at uh, animal bones from Chaco and animal bones from the Mesa Verde area to try and see where animals are coming from. If you look at things like strontium isotopes, you can see where an animal was kind of growing up and eating <coughs> because the, the ground leaves a different chemical signature in the food that the animal eats and then that's left in the animal bones, so kind of like the corn. And you can sometimes, if you have the right kind of geology, identify that animals are coming from different places and ending up in a place where you wouldn't expect. So you might be able to see things imported to Chaco, for example. So I think that's a really, th really interesting thing to try and look at is uh, how much transport of these animals is going on and can we ever see it in the bones or were they never really carrying bones around? So um, that Chaco and transport thing is really interesting. I don't think there's been a lot of research on animals specifically. I can only think of one dissertation from U of A pretty recently that did that, but there's not a lot of other literature about that. So it'll be really interesting to see how that turns out. This one's kind of indirect. Um, have you found evidence in any of your bone collections anywhere that people were also using the bones for something, either tools or flutes, things like that? And if so, did they like certain parts in particular? They definitely were making bone tools and they definitely did like certain parts. Um, one of the things that kind of frustrated me in doing some of these studies was that I was trying to get data from as many sites as I could, but if the excavations are too old, sometimes the only bones that people collected and analyzed were the tools. So in those sites we have almost all large mammals because people did like the bones of big animals for tools and they especially liked uh, long bones, they liked something with the end of a long bone and part of the shaft and they would make it into something pointy like an awl or something like that. Sometimes they would make little decorated tubes out of the shaft of long bones. So there are definitely certain bones that people like to make tools out of and a lot of them are big animal bones. There's certain bones of rabbits that they also like for awls, uh, some of the long bones too. So that, can, that definitely affects faunal assemblages and if you look at an assemblage that's too old where people only kept the tools, it'll look like it's dominated by uh, deer and pronghorn because that's what they really like to make the tools out of. Uh, Ruth, one more question here. I was really fascinated when you said that you were not getting, um, that your <coughs> proportion of jackrabbits to cottontails was not too dramatically different. My, my own experience as a zooarchaeologist has been pretty much exclusively, not entirely, but mostly in non-agricultural sites, and we have an overwhelming dominance of jackrabbits in the non-agricultural sites, and so I've been sitting here wondering if, if this is really in part, at least as far as the lagomorphs are concerned, if you really are seeing a garden hunting pattern and that it would more equally attract the, and make them more easily caught in the same level of effort, the jackrabbits and the, and the <coughs> cottontails, whereas, in non-agricultural environments, my own experience is that you get way, way, way more jackrabbits. Yeah. Um, it says you're a zooarchaeologist. I have an article <laughs> in Kiva that talks about that. <laughs> so I have an article in Kiva that talks about that. Right. I think well, it's maybe 2005 or 2006 or something like that. So if you look back in Kiva, uh, it's in there. And also, you're probably aware of this again since you're a zooarchaeologist, but John Driver has talked quite a bit about that ratio and about how in some parts of the Southwest, it's dominated by cottontails sort of naturally, and in other places it's dominated by jackrabbits. So elevation and things like that can, can play a big role in this. Uh, but what I meant was that there aren't certain sites in the group of sites I looked at that have tons of jackrabbits, where these other sites have mostly cottontails. So I can't pick out certain sites as, oh, jackrabbit drive. They all kind of look the same. <laughs>
quick question. Is there a lot of evidence that they did preservation on the meat and for the games that they caught? Was there a lot um, of long-term preservation on that? It's hard to see, I think, because probably they were making things like jerky, yeah. but that doesn't involve bones. So that's kind of a hard question for us to get at. I would think yes, and ethnographically people were preserving meat, uh, but it's not something that we can see very easily in the archaeological record, really. But it makes sense that they would. Thank you, thank you very much, Karen, and uh, thank you all for coming out tonight. <coughs>